uh, welcome to my April wrap up video. There's a lot of books to get through, so I'm gonna try and do it really quickly. And as soon as I'm done wrapping this up, I'm gonna start reading and doing a reading vlog for the whole month, um, or as long as it takes me this month to read all of my picks for the 1900 to 1950 readathon um, hosted by Katie at Books and Things. So I'm so excited, and um, I wanna just get through these wrap ups really fast. And coffee. Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm gonna start with my lowest to my highest. Um, so two stars, no one stars this month, two stars for The Language of Flowers. I wrote um, a review for this and it's posted on Goodreads and it's posted on my Instagram if you ever want to go more in depth um, than just seeing what I did read over a month, then you should head to Goodreads or Instagram. So here we go. Um, the Language of Flowers. This was a two star for me for a lot of different reasons. A big one though is that it just didn't feel believable. It's a two star for me. Even though, even though I actually really enjoyed the writing style um, of Vanessa Diffenbau and I would be willing to try and read something else by her that is about something else. The next book that got two stars for me um, is, this came up um, in my library audiobooks and I thought, you know what, I, I feel like, A, I feel like I wanna read something about nature and B, I know this is a classic and I know the name, like I know this author's name and I've never read anything by them. And so I just kind of thought this is maybe a book that is like a, a should read and it was okay. It was two stars. It was two stars because I don't think he and I would be friends. <laughs> and when you read somebody's like personal reflections on something, you kind of really have to have something in common with them. And what I have in common with him is a love and an appreciation for public spaces, for public parks, for nature, for wide open spaces. What I really felt grossed out by was just him as a person like good for him but who he is is not somebody i want to spend time with so it was two stars for me now we're on to the three star reads so my first one is an audiobook that is uh who is maude dixon this one was slow to start and i if it had not been an audiobook i probably wouldn't have finished it because it was just, I, was, I didn't know where it was going and I didn't really care to find out until I was about uh, two thirds of the way through. And then things got twisty, like I had anticipated they would be. And um, the story is, I think it's pretty fresh. It's pretty original. The writing is oddly paced. You know, it was fine. It's not the greatest uh, experience I've ever had with a book especially with a thriller, um, but it was fine. It was fine. I don't think I'd recommend it to anybody, and I think that's why I gave it three stars. The next one is an audiobook. Uh, this is The Babysitter, My Summer with a Serial Killer. I feel like I gave this three stars because I feel like, I think it's the editor's fault, the writer never takes their their memoir and their experience past like just a description of what happened. There's no meaning made. And I don't want to read true crime just to read about the events. It's, it's definitely well written. It's definitely engaging. It's definitely um, compelling. But then in the end, it's just like, and that happened end of story that happened so yeah it wasn't the book for me I couldn't even make my own meaning out of it beyond like don't break your children and take care of your children um but I already know that so yeah it just felt like I think that the editor really needed to push for more from that author so now um I get into some 
physical books, finally. Um, so I read The Unredeemed Captive. I read this for my Jenga, one of my Jenga challenges. And it was a book that I'd had on my shelf for a really, really long time. I got it for Christmas, um, I would say probably in like 2012. <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. Um, and I enjoyed it. I gave it three stars. This is very well researched, very well written, very judgmental in a lot of ways. Yeah, it was fine. If I was going to write a report, this would be a great book to go to. Something completely different. Uh, this is The Secrets at Maple Syrup Farm by Rebecca Raisin. I read a Rebecca Raisin, I read two Rebecca Raisins um, last year, no, year before last. Um, and I loved them both so much. They were about traveling shops, a traveling tea shop and a traveling bookshop. And they were just so light and airy and fun and funny and fast and endearing. They were so endearing. And this one felt really flat. <laughs> um, this one was missing a lot of the character development. It was missing, um, a lot of the humor. I mean, there's definitely some humor in here, but it's more drama than rom-com. And I think what I, whoops, and I think what I wanted from her was rom-com. That's what this was, a rom-com that took itself seriously. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with this book. I think it just wasn't what I wanted it to be. Thus, it's three stars. coffee sip break. Then I read the next book in the Barchester Chronicle series. This is Dr. Thorne. And this was the only one in that series that I was already familiar with. I had already watched um, the Amazon Prime mini series or or short series or whatever they call them. Um, and the book was better. <laughs> the book was so much better. I actually really enjoyed this. And yet it's still three stars for me. I've given three stars to everything I've read by Trollope this year. Um, it was still three stars for me because it's muted, it's flat, it's, <sighs> I don't know what it is about me and Trollope. We just, it's fine, but he's so dull. Even when I'm laughing out loud, like not so much in this one, but in um, Barchester Chronicles, no, Barchester Towers, um, the book that came right before this and right after The Warden, the love scenes in that literally made me laugh out loud. But I was still feeling disconnected from it. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm not willing to break up, but I'm not willing to take it to the next level either. So three stars yet again, even though I really did enjoy Dr. Thorne. Hot British boyfriend. This is one I will be unhauling. I will be passing this on to a teenager who will love it to death. My teenage self would have read and reread and reread this. This was just plain fun. Um, it is, it's about a girl who goes through kind of a traumatizing experience. I think all teen movies, like you can probably guess kind of what she goes through and ends up as a result of that experience. Um, being able to go overseas to London and spend a semester um, taking some classes at a university there. She's a high schooler. And really kind of learning to find herself and learning what true friendship really looks like and figuring out her love life. Um, and it's very sweet and it's very gentle and it's very innocent and it's very funny and it's just delightful. And I'm not sad that I read it once. I will never read it again. It's also very teenage. <laughs> but yeah, I, I highly recommend this if you have teenage girls that, um, that are quirky. Um, maybe they don't feel like they fit in or maybe they are trying to change themselves to fit in. Um, this is a really great message. It's really delivered in a palatable way. And yeah, Christy Boyce, you did good. Um, in, in the case histories, I don't know if this series has a name, but like in the case histories series, um, the Jackson Brody books. I read the second one, uh, One Good Turn, 
And this was fine. This was good. It was, I think, just not what I was in the mood for. So I'm gonna, I have all the rest of them and I really want to read them. Um, and I do really enjoy, I love to hate Jackson Brody. Um, he is such a jerk and I love him anyway. <laughs> but this one felt darker than the first one. The first one is dark and this one felt darker. And I just don't think that I was in the mood for it. I was looking for and enjoying a lot of lighthearted reads, even though I have some really heavy ones in here. What I was really gelling with were things like Hot British Boyfriend. Um, and that's just where I was in the month of April. So the, it got three stars from me. There's again, nothing inherently wrong with this storytelling or this writing and I'm not put off to pick up the next book, but I'm not gonna pick it up this month. I'm gonna wait. I think it might be my darker days, like uh, my fall and winter reading that it fits in better with. Um, so yes, similar story with this one, The Girls in the Garden. So last month I also read um, my first Lisa Jewell. That was The Family Upstairs and it, it like was so satisfying. I loved every little bit of it. Um, and I realized that I had a Lisa Jewell on my shelf that I'd had on my shelf for a really long time that I had never read. So I pulled it out and I read it and I did not enjoy this one as much as I enjoyed The Family Upstairs. I feel like this story has been told many different times and many different iterations. This is an older book than uh, The Family Upstairs. I think that Lisa Jewell has um, matured a little bit as an author, I don't know. I'm so excited to try something else by Lisa Jewell. This was not for me. I will probably put this in a little free library. Um, somebody else will enjoy this. If this had been the first Lisa Jewell I read, I probably wouldn't be as excited about reading Lisa Jewell as I was after reading The Family Upstairs. The Family Upstairs, I think, is the place to start with Lisa Jewell, for sure. Next, I read another book that I had had on my shelf for a while, not a super long time, a couple years, The Jane Austen Society. Now, I picked this, I pulled this off my shelf because it looked light and springy, and Jane Austen usually means humor and love, and yes, there is love in this book. Um, but other than that, it's incredibly dark and slow and not funny. It's very sad um, most of the time. And there is love and there, it, there are moments of like triumph, but this is a drama. This is a deadpan, like straight, flat drama. And I, I think it's really quality writing and the story was compelling, but also it's not the kind of story that I enjoy. It followed multiple perspectives. It followed multiple lives, um, all in proximity to each other. It brings them all together in the end. It was just really, really unhappy. And not only was it not what I was looking for in April, it's not really what I'm ever looking for. I don't like to read books that rejoice in sorrow and, and romanticize sadness and pain. And I feel like that's what this book did. I don't know that that's what it was intending to do. I feel like it thought that it was really uplifting and the storyline like if I were to graph the story on paper it would sound uplifting but something about the heaviness of the dark moments really overshadow any happiness in the end so not the book for me I will unhaul this then I read another book that I had I was feeling I don't know I don't know what I was feeling um, but I've had this for a really long time and I pulled it off my shelf and I read Sacred Success A Course in Financial Miracles and I don't think that this is definitely I, I definitely don't think this is a course in financial miracles um it was interesting and I it was really engaging and I read it really quickly and I'm going to unhaul it I, that's part of the reason why I was reading it was just to see like is this a reference book that I need to keep on my shelf it was okay it wasn't engaging enough to be something that I would like to go back to and it wasn't it was all like really kind of common sense I did learn a little bit about investing that I didn't know before. There's a lot I don't know about investing. This book taught me a little bit more than the little I already knew. <laughs> so 
If you are looking for a very, very basic introduction to being in charge of your own finances, then maybe that's the book for you was not the book for me. Now we're going into our four star reads. And some of these were really, really good. We're gonna start with this one, which I listened to, Uprooted. I listened to that on a whim. It was a book that I had put on hold at the library I don't know when, and it just showed up. I don't remember putting it on hold. And I have a sneaking suspicion that I put it on hold because it was a pretty cover. <laughs> Sometimes I've been known to do that. Um, and then I just started listening to it one Saturday and I was like, you know what, I'll just see what this is like. And I listened to it pretty much in a day. I think it was like a day and then maybe two walks to school, um, like two 15 minute sessions after that. And it was really, really lovely. It is a memoir and it's also a call to return to the places that we are from. And it's a call to create roots. And you don't know me, but <laughs> I don't have roots. Um, I grew up moving all the time. And as an adult, I also move. I move overseas all the time. I move across the country all the time. Um, I enjoy that. And that feels really normal and natural to me because of the way that I grew up. Um, I can't, you know, like I can barely imagine my mom's side of the family has stayed put in the same town and for a long time in the same house. Um, so I, I can see it, but I can't imagine what it might feel like to never be new, you know, to, to never leave. Um, because then you also never come back. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I just, it's so different from my own experience. And so it was interesting to me to read from the perspective of this woman who uh, grew up in the Midwest. Well, I think Idaho, grew up in Idaho and, um, and left for a city and for a life that was probably much more common to most of the people who are watching this. And, um, then really started to consider her responsibility in going back to keep the farm life and community life going. It's going extinct and that is going to have huge irreversible repercussions on our society, our way of life, and our ability to maintain um, our own sustenance. I found it extremely well written, extremely engaging, a super fast read, a four-star read for me. Then for my In Real Life book club, I read The Lost Apothecary uh, by Sarah Penner and gave it four stars because it was a really enjoyable experience for me to read. Um, but also this really felt like a first novel and it has a lot of problems. There's two different timelines and three different voices telling the story. Uh, two voices are in the past and one is in the present. The voice in the present is completely unbelievable and everything that happens in it is just so incredibly convenient and entirely unbelievable. So that was annoying and I skim read through most of the present. <coughs> And then in the past, you have these two different characters. One's voice is very stilted and angry and standoffish, and you never get to know this person, even though uh, the book is named after them. And the other is a young girl, and I really enjoyed the parts that I read from that perspective. That perspective made the whole book for me. And then four stars, because I didn't see the end coming. Um, I did enjoy the ending, even though, again, completely unbelievable. Yeah, I don't know. It was, it, one of the people in my book group said like, this is this author's fantasy. Um, and I can see that. I can totally see that. It reads like, you know, you're sitting on a long flight and you start to tell yourself a story about your own future. That's what this feels like. It's somebody making up a story about themselves. How, you know, like, what if this happened? Oh, wouldn't it be awesome if this was this way? Um, oh, if only, if only, if only, if only. Next, I read a book that I bought for myself a few years ago. Uh, this is The Loveliest Chocolate Shop in Paris. This is by Jenny Colgan. I had started reading it, but put it down because it was a little slow. And I, um, I picked it back up finally and really enjoyed it this time. I, it was it just hit the spot for me. Um, this is also told in multiple voices and it has two different time periods. Um, 
and pulls them together. It is, it is heavy. It's not a comedy in any way, shape or form. It's melodramatic. Um, but it's done in a really like loving way. I felt connected to all the characters. Um, I loved the Paris setting so much. Yeah, I just really enjoyed this. And I don't always feel that way about Jenny Colgan. Um, she's hit and miss with me. And I, I'm so glad I purchased this and didn't just read it from the library because this was a great read for me, especially for this April. Like this really, really struck a very nice chord with me. So tears at the end, but also happiness. It was just really, really great. Perfect. Perfect book for me for April. I didn't give it five stars though. And that's because it at moments read a little slow just a little slow. And I do find that with Jenny Colgan. Um, I feel like sometimes her books could be a little shorter, <laughs> but that's just me. Last month I read um, The Family Plot by Sherry Priest. Now, what really is annoying me right now is that recommending Sherry Priest to people is becoming really difficult because newer books are coming out and they have the titles of her books. So there's a brand new family plot coming out by somebody else. But the book that I loved was by Sherry Priest. The family plot by Sherry Priest. I loved it so much. It was the perfect ghost story. It was so chilling and so wonderful. And I just loved every second of that reading experience. So I picked up her next book, um, The Toll by Sherry Priest. And of course, there's a very famous last book in a series called The Toll. Um, very, very different. That's a fantasy book. It is not at all the same as this, The Toll. So as I recommend this four star book to you, please know it's Sherry Priest's The Toll. Um, and this is, it's got a little tagline that says Southern Gothic horror with a contemporary twist. This book felt like reading a Twilight Zone episode. It was wonderful and dark and terrifying and creepy and gross. And you felt like the southern syrupy slowness of it. But it was perfect because it was the setting itself. It plays with time and space. It reinvents that uh, myth of the troll under the bridge. It felt a little Suki Stackhouse. It was just really wonderfully delightful and I adored it. And I think what I really love about Sherry Priest is that she knows how to end her stories. Um, I can read all the Stephen King on the planet and really enjoy them until the end. I have never, never, not once, in probably 20 books, enjoyed a Stephen King ending. Never. I cannot name one positive Stephen King ending experience. I have read two horror novels. I've read three books by and two horror novels by Sherry Priest. And the woman knows how to end a story. I mean, it's just, it's creepy enough. There's enough unexplained and there's enough resolution that you walk away feeling like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's why I really, really, really love Sherry Priest. Um, I will read anything this woman puts out. Anything. Take my money. I read, I realized, I realized that a book that I had read a few years ago, 1000 White Women by Jim Fergus, was actually not a standalone. It was a series. And I realized that the last book in this trilogy was being released this month. Well, April, not May. That it was being released in April. So I had pre-ordered that book. And then I saw that the second book was available on um, Book Outlet. So I picked up that second book and read it. And that is The Vengeance of Mothers by Jim Fergus. Now, these books are just wild romps. They are written as journals by these, by one or two women who are part of a larger group of women um, who in a very fictional history, a very fictional history, um, were part of a campaign by the US government to um, dismantle Native American culture from the inside by sending white women to marry them. The hope was in this fictional history, 
the hope was that the culture of the white women would supersede the Native American culture and they would help make uh, an easier transition of the Native American people into a white culture. And of course that backfires and the women become very much immersed in the Native American culture, very loyal, without Without too much of a spoiler, at the end of the first book, there's a huge battle and the cavalry, the white soldiers, can no longer tell the difference between, you know, they don't know who is one of the white women and who is not, and they kill indiscriminately during that battle and um, there's a lot of loss. And so the second book in the series is called The Vengeance of Mothers and it picks up where the last book left off and it also introducing a new cast of characters because there is a group of women who were coming out to join the original group of women and while they're on the train in transit um, across the country from the east coast the the battle from the previous book is happening and um, the government has dismantled the program and so they don't have protection or backing or introduction or anything and their train gets hijacked by a tribe from by by one of the tribes that our book is featuring and so yeah it's just it was really fun and it's very respectful of native american culture there are some problematic things. I mean, for one thing, Jim Fergus, who, the author, is neither Native American nor a woman, and he is writing f the both of those perspectives. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit problematic, but the goal of this is to tell a Western story that is from the Native American and the female perspective, and Jim does that. So I've read some things on Goodreads, and I feel like they are written by people who haven't actually read the books. So don't judge a book by what you think it is. Read the book. I'm excited to read Strong Heart, the final um, chapter in this trilogy, this month. I read Bristol House, part of one of my big book hauls in December, and um, I picked this up because it is like a ghost story and it travels across time and it takes place in London. And I had just, like I've already said, finished The Family Plot, which was such a great ghost story. And I think I wanted more ghost story. And so I picked this up and at first I wasn't enjoying it because it was like, oh, it's so academic. It's so literary. And then I just got so sucked into it. It was really good. It's really good. Um, it's about the Jew of Holborn who was, what's it about? It's about the Jew of Holborn. It's about a a, an alcoholic woman, uh, like a recovering alcoholic who gets offered the job of a lifetime and doesn't know why, um, takes it, goes to Bristol, ends up, well, goes to London, ends up living in Bristol House, like moments upon arrival, ends up being, uh, like having an encounter with some monk ghosts. And it's about the historical relationship between the monk and the um, Jews, Jew of Holborn's daughter and the Jew himself, because at the time it was illegal to be Jewish within the city limits um, in the, the Elizabethan era. And so this person was openly living as an illegal person within the city limits. And how was that possible? And what was going on? And who was protecting this person? And and what were the implications of what were the reasons? There's also buried treasure and, and espionage and just all sorts of stuff. This book is like a Dan Brown and an Agatha Christie and a Stephen King and A.S. Byatt. Yeah. So it's like Byatt, King, Christy, Dan Brown got together and wrote a book. <laughs> It's really unique and wonderful. Yeah, I loved it from beginning to end. Next I read I Want to Be Where You Are um, for a book that is about a person of color who 
doesn't have their pain as the central focus of the book. Um, it's not about black pain. And this was really nice and um, gentle and engaging. It's a YA novel about a girl who ends up going on an epic road trip with somebody who used to be one of her really good friends who's become an enemy through some miscommunication and some poor choices. Um, and it's about the two of them and his dog going on an epic journey to try to get her to um, a ballet recital um, audition and, and all of the lies they have to tell and the rules they have to break. In a lot of ways, it reminded me of like a 1980s movie. <laughs> but it takes place right now. So, you know, this is like John Hughes feel good type of reading. Um, you know, it has breakfast club levels of self-discovery, I would say, but it has all the happy feels of pretty in pink. Yeah, that's what this is. I also read Empire of Wild by Sherry uh, Dimeline, and this is a Native American horror story. It is really well done. I only gave it four stars just because it was a little bit, I don't want to say slow. It wasn't slow, but also it was slow. <laughs> so it read, it read really quickly, but not much happens. Um, but the ending, the ending is the four stars. The ending is beautiful, beautiful. Um, yeah really, really, really beautiful. Um, and by beautiful, I don't mean like heartfelt beautiful. I mean like really, really well done, impactful, knock you off your seat kind of ending. I would love to see this as a movie more than read this as a book. All right, now we're on our five stars. First, we have this one, Seven Fallen Feathers. This is one that I didn't intend to read this month, but I had it on hold and it came in through the library. And so I just listened to it. I actually listened to it in one afternoon, Seven Fallen Feathers. And it was excellent. It was really excellent. Um, I read this for the Read Harder Challenge um, prompt, Investigative Fiction by a Person of Color. Uh, it is about the disappearance and deaths of seven more, but it focuses on seven students uh, in Thunder Bay, Canada, and it's an expose of residential schools, and it is heartbreaking, and it's so well done. Highly recommend it. Then I read this one. This is maybe my favorite book of the year so far. This is The Witch of I. Like, there's, there's not really a page in here that isn't, like, completely and utterly outlined and marked up. I adored this book so much and I want to read everything by Katherine Nuremberger and she's got poetry and another um, essay collection out. She also teaches writing at the University of Minnesota, makes me want to go to the University of Minnesota <laughs> and study under this woman. Like I just adored this. It is memoir, it is essay, it is history, it is social commentary, um, it is political commentary. At the beginning, at the start, it feels like you're reading just um, each chapter is devoted to a different woman in history who has been killed for being something outside of, of society, the society that is supposed to protect them. One point, um, she has one chapter that's about her struggle with trying to decide whether or not to include the story of a male witch, a warlock, who was killed, and decides that yes, she will include the story, but in a very different way, and, and says, because my point was not women per se, but something about social control and the mythologies of justice systems. That's what this is about. It takes you until page 172 to get there. It's about so much more before that, but that, I, that pulling together of her thoughts was beautiful. I have concluded there is nothing new to learn about history. There is only what I might try once more to clearly see. The history of witches is a history of need. When you hear someone say Medusa was hideous with hair full of snakes, that is some xenophobic I can't say the next word um, on my YouTube channel, uh, but it's xenophobic, let's say tomfoolery, by people who lived on the other shore of the Mediterranean Sea. 
When you hear she was a dangerous and vengeful witch, that means she was as measured in the congregational hearings on the subject of known rapist Poseidon as any woman so subpoenaed always is. And then I understood it was all very simple. I wanted a garden, and since a garden is about containing chaos inside of order, I was willing to tear out a hillside of wildflowers and then plant the exact same species back to have it. I started to see that whatever else happened, I was also the antidote to myself. Everything you think you have seen is actually your visual cortex conversing with the rest of your occipital lobe about their best guesses for smoothing out the many gaps in their sensory data to create a coherent image. Even if you actually saw Ursula Kemp's lamb shake off his wool and clumsy hooves to stand up straight as a demon named Jack, you couldn't really have seen it. I absolutely love this book. From beginning to end, you can read each chapter individually as a standalone essay, but I recommend you read them all together as one entity. My Dickens for the month was Barnaby Rudge. Wow! I'd never even heard of this book. I knew nothing about it. Uh, the only thing that I knew about it was a little bit wrong. Um, I thought that Barnaby Rudge was a historical figure, but no, it just takes place in a historical time. Um, it is about... Um, a set of riots that happen because of conflict over Catholicism versus the Church of England. I don't know. Um, the Anglicans versus the Catholics and vice versa. It is like, a, it's kind of like a Daphne du Maurier kind of feeling, like a lot of Jamaica Inn kind of vibes. And then it's this commentary about the people and voice and rebellion and uh, protest that feels so relevant to what is happening in the United States today. I wish that this were getting a revival. I wish that this had a movie. The, there's a couple of film versions. Two of them are black and white. One is from like 1912 or something. Come on, people. What are you doing? We need this story and we need it now. This is an amazing book. It's not like the rest of Dickens. It's not like the rest of Dickens. The rest of Dickens are amazing books, but this one reads very differently. Um, and if you want to know why, look at my, my reviews. I do go into it a little bit. Um, but whoa, I read The Memoir Project. Uh, this was a great little read, super short, lots of insight, felt like a masterclass about writing personal essays. Excellent. If you enjoy writing, if you enjoy writing personal essays, if you want to pick that up um, and give it a try, I highly recommend this. Again, it is The Memoir Project by Marion Roach Smith. Super short, packs a huge, huge, huge punch. I read uh, the next book in the Irish Country Doctor series. This was an Irish Country Courtship. It was delightful. They all are delightful. This one took the story forward a little bit. I won't tell you how or why because if you are reading the series there are some big surprises in this one. Just delightful. I'm reading the next one obviously. I read the second book in the Mirror, I always get this wrong, the Mirror Visitor saga or series. There are ultimately four of these. It is a quartet of books. Um, I have the third one with me and I will be reading that one this month, but this is The Missing of Claire de Lune and I loved this. If you like a slow burn romance and super fun fantasy worlds and magic systems that are pretty unique as well as like creation mythology. Um, it's all in here. This is just a delightful read. It really opened me up to fantasy. I read some fantasy, but very sparingly and very like specific kinds of fantasy. Uh, C.S. Lewis kind of fantasy. I think I've always been like rejectful of world building, but for whatever reason, tons of world building in these and I still love it. These feel like watching Studio Ghibli films. I say that over and over, but it never stops being true. I did a reread of The Blue Castle by Ellen Montgomery. This is my favorite book by Ellen Montgomery. I know, I know, you've got the Anne's, you've got the Emily's, I love them all, but this is my favorite one. And I try to reread it like once every year or two. This year for the first time I listened to it instead of physically reading my copy. It was my very first time listening to it and 
you know, it's always a different experience. I really loved it. The big thing about it was I've always said Barney Snaith and the recording says Snaith and that drove me a little bit crazy. Hearts West, this super short little volume um, is about mail order brides, um, mostly on the West Coast. It is also, I mean, each chapter is about bringing women from one part of the world, not the world, but one part of the States to one, to the West to, um, to populate the land, I guess. And there's a story in here about uh, Seattle and how many men there were and how few women there were and how somebody actually goes and, um, and has to like campaign on the East Coast to try and convince women to come out. Um, there are stories in here about women who, you know, blindly go, they answer a ad in the paper or their mission board tells them this is the man you should marry if you want to get married before you go on the field. Um, and those work out really well sometimes. And sometimes, you know, there's one, there's one story in here where a woman is traveling from California to, I believe, New Mexico. Um, and her stagecoach is hijacked and um, she realizes when she finally arrives safely at her destination that the man who hijacked her stagecoach is actually her husband to be. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, just really, really fun, true stories. Um, each chapter is a different story and they read really quickly and they are really engaging and Enjoyed it. Enjoyed every moment of it. I read Rising Out of Hatred by Eli Saslow. This is um, the awakening of a former white nationalist. The individual who this book is about was the son of one of the leading white nationalists in the nation, the godson of the grandmaster of the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan. And he ends up going to college in Sarasota, uh, where I have lived. I lived in Bradenton, right next to Sarasota for many years. And so that was really fun for me to like know the new college campus and everything. So he ends up going to the new college and um, getting to know people <laughs> who aren't white nationalists. And what really happens here is not that it's this, this story is not powerful to me because someone changed. This story is powerful to me because all the people around him didn't leave him. His friends that he makes at the new college, I mean, some of them don't stick around, but the real friends stay because he's a nice guy. He's a white nationalist and that comes with some really cruel and awful ideologies. And yet on the individual level, he sees all these people he hates on the big scale. He sees them as people and he's nice and smart and well-mannered and kind and helpful and has like a servant heart kind of attitude. And he's full of ideas that harm limit lead to the deaths of many people that incite violence. And he's, he's hosting a radio show inciting people to violence. On the campus, he's friends with really strong friendships with a group of Jewish students. He has really strong friendships with a group of black students. He has really strong friendships with um, a lot of different kinds of people who all fall into categories of people he should hate. Those people find out who he is and they don't abandon him. They work with him and slowly but surely he realizes, mostly he realizes uh, the lack of personal integrity he has and he makes a choice and it's a struggle, but he makes a choice and his family abandons him. It's really well written. It's really engaging. What really stuck out to me was the people around him and the, con the constancy of the people around him as opposed to his change. I read this, I read this in one sitting. This is, I mean, it's just a absolutely delightful um, story of a prince who likes to dress in drag. And the dressmaker who makes his dresses for him and how he is outed before his time, before he's willing 
And um, what happens as a result of all of that? It is beautiful. It's a really, really, it's beautiful inside and out. Um, lovely book. Very fast read. I read The Gromerians. This is another book that I had hauled for myself, um, I think back in December, probably as part of my birthday haul. And I loved this. This was so weird and quirky and wonderful. I didn't know if I was enjoying it while I was reading it. I kept kind of going like, what is the point? But it has stuck with me and I keep thinking about it. And the more I think about it, the more I appreciate it. Um, so really sm slim little volume, but um, I would call this expert expert storytelling. Two more. The Lost Village. I loved this. I love this so much. Um, this was, it's like a cult book. It's a Blair Witch book. It's um, creepy and wonderful and weird and unbelievable, but it doesn't matter because it's a horror story. Really, really fun. I enjoyed this so much. Um, and I definitely think that I would read it again. So it's also well written. Um, yeah, really, really loved it. Loved it. I would love to see a movie of it, actually. Loved it. And finally, I read The Little House Cookbook, and I thought that I might find something in here to cook, but actually, no, there's nothing in here that I want to cook. <laughs> Thank goodness that I do not live in the Western times. Um, <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. But um, if you've ever been curious about, if you've read the books, you've ever been curious about like the syrup candy they made in the snow or um, how to get lard or any of those things, uh, the Little House Cookbook might be the place for you to go. So that's it. Um, my wrap up for the month. And now I am going to go and start reading for May. And I'm so excited about that. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And yeah, till next time.